I believe God's doing something so significant in this season. Amen? How many know that there's more than just chaos going on? The Lord is doing something that the unbelieving world won't see. Only the believing world will see. There's never been a time in our, our lives where we need to see with faith and see through just the, what is in the natural to into, into what's going on spiritually. To that end, I want to... Uh, some of you may be aware it's already on the, inter- on the web and um, in the midst of our most recent um, change in Lamar County's stance on vaccination and mask requirements, um, we felt as a team it was time to sit down and ask the question of, okay, in this, in this what feels like a different wave than what we've been in, how are we going to respond? What is our stance? From the beginning of this, I have pushed and fought and encouraged us to stand in Romans 13, where it just says to obey and be subject to the governing authorities. I want to be clear with something. It wasn't because I felt like we didn't have a place we could stand biblically different. It just felt like the Lord was really clear. In this season, this is what I want from you. In hindsight, I wouldn't change a thing. I didn't expect what was going to happen, and that was a There's never been a time in the history of the people of God where I feel like division's been more prevalent. We look around, we see it. I think the Lord has used this last season, this last 18 months, to really challenge what unity in the spirit looks like. Because a lot of us believe unity in the spirit means we align on every idea. That That doesn't mean that at all. Technically, Paul's statement in Ephesians 4, I have no, if I start this trail, I may never get to my notes. Who cares? All right, let's go. In Ephesians 4, what Paul will say is is fight for oneness in the Spirit. Oneness in the Spirit, it doesn't mean we agree on everything. It means we understand which things we must agree on. Christ and Him crucified. The salvation of sin through the blood of Jesus. Preach the cross and Him crucified. That's what Paul will teach. We can align on these things. And when it comes to things outside of that scope, those are what is referred to in the scriptures as secondary convictions. We are to prefer one another in love. What does that mean? It means I learn how to say, we don't actually have to see this the same to be together in this. We're united because of Jesus. We know God's called us to this house together. We have differences of opinion. I support yours. I'm asking you to support mine. On issues where it's black and white scripturally, I think those are the moments where it's right for us to say, I'm struggling right now with whatever thing it is because the scriptures say this. Can we talk about it? But the enemy is using, not just, I mean, it's it's everywhere, church, using these odd little social dynamics and topics to split the people of God. Why would he do that? Because he can You see, the moment we stand and say, you cannot divide us, he'll stop trying. I think the people of God are dividable right now. It was never the heart of God for us to be dividable. That's why Paul will say in Ephesians 4, live in a manner worthy of your calling. Be humble, be gentle, be gracious. Make allowances for each other's faults. This word humble is to have an accurate view of oneself. That's what the word means. How many would agree with me with this statement? I'm a sinner. I've got my stuff, right? If I look around the room and go, hey, we all have stuff, we know that. Maybe humility means I just simply say to my friends and family around me, I do not demand out of you perfection. I'm going to give you the same grace he does. I'm never going to tell you it's okay to be screwed up. I'm going to challenge you. Get healthy. Live in a manner worthy of your calling. Get healthy. But we've got to stop putting lines in the sand that Jesus didn't put. Because the enemy uses those. Be humble. Be gentle. Do you know what gentleness is? It's a qualifier of communication. You can say anything gently. You can also say anything harshly. 
Gentleness is the antithesis of harshness. It deals with how we communicate. In this same passage at the end, Paul will say, speak the truth in what? I don't think I had everybody. Speak the truth in love. Which means, if you can't say it in love, bite your tongue. A lot of times in our culture right now, we believe the truth is in and of itself the reason to speak. That's not what Paul teaches. I'm in Ephesians 4 here, and I'm just walking through. I have this bizarre gift where I can see it in my head. So as a worship leader, it's fantastic because I can see chord charts. Um, And so in my Bible, it's down here in the lower portion of chapter 4. Speak the truth in love. He says, be angry, but don't sin. Why? Because anger creates an access point for the enemy in your life. The word is a strategic term. It says it gives him a mighty foothold. It's, it's like he has a place to plant in your, in your life. How many lately would say anger's been easier to find in this climate that we're in socially? Hasn't been difficult to find things to be angry about. Anger's not sin. Sinning in anger is. I just want to encourage us. Be humble. Be gentle. Be gracious, which means we give a lot of space for stupidity around us. Make allowances for each other's faults. The idea is a banking transaction. It literally means to set something aside to be spent. It would be the equivalent of me saying to my sons, I know in the course of your lifetime you're going to disappoint me. It's going to happen. Everybody does. I want you to know ahead of time I've already decided I forgive you. There's a bank account of forgiveness that you can draw on when that happens. I've set it aside. I've made an allowance for you to screw up. That is what we're called to do with each other. That each of us should be able to say to the world around us, to the family of God around us, when you need that forgiveness, it's already been said yes. I've already done it. I'm not going to hold you to your failure. How many would agree with me that's not very easy? Really? It's only like four of us that have a hard time with that? (laughs) Because our rights get violated, and then entitlement comes up, and a sense of, I don't deserve this, I've been done wrong. All those things are human reactions, and what Paul's calling us to is a spiritual condition that says, I want you to transcend that. Make allowance for each other's faults. And then he adds this last thing. Keep yourselves united, one, in the spirit, through the bonds of peace. I love this phrase, bonds of peace, because in my mind, what instantly comes to the forefront of my mind is that we have shackles that we're all connected with called peace, which means I might want to get away, but I can't. I'm forced by the Holy Spirit to work it out with the family of God around me. Jesus models something that is my favorite thing about him when he says to the Father, I don't actually want to do this thing you gave me to do. If it's possible, will you please find somebody else to do this? Take this cup from me. I don't want to go to the cross. We, we, make, we just don't, we gloss over it like with eloquence, like, oh, if it's possible, let this cup pass. Now, what he was saying is, I don't want to do this. And I'm telling you up front, I don't want to do this. I love that because it gives us permission to not want to do the things we have to do, but it doesn't give us permission to not do them. It means we can discipline ourselves in the spirit and go, I don't want to be at peace with you right now. It's going to be like chewing broken glass to be at peace with you right now. But I'm going to do it because of the Holy Spirit. What I'm talking about is what we have been placed in, church, is a litmus test for whether or not we will stay united as the people of God. If you want to read the declaration, it's really simple. I just said, I believe worshiping together with an unveiled face is actually part of the call of God on the people of God. And so we're going to, as a family inside this house, we're going to protect that and we're going to stay that way. 
If people desire to wear masks, I'm going to support that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm just not going to require it. When it comes to vaccination, that is a secondary conviction that is up to you, not up to me. It's not defined in the scriptures. Therefore, I will not refuse people based upon that status, and I will not require it. I won't require it of my staff. I won't require it of anybody around me. I think, I think biblically that is wrong. It violates the come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And so we have took a biblical stand on these things, and it, but I want to be clear. I understand there's a sense of incredible relief in a lot of us. They're like, oh, finally, somebody's not being crazy. But I want to be really careful with this. This is not of a, the bedrock for reformation. This deals with us in this house and how we worship together. We're going to protect that in our gathering. When we walk outside these doors, we are going to walk in aggressive honor to the region. Whether we like it or not, we're doing it. Because that's what it means to be subject to the rulers that govern you. I sat on the, the Larimer County call Thursday night. Not because I wanted to, but my wife did. So I honored her and we sat and listened to the call. <laughs> I, I, there was a lot of frustration and anger in the, in, in the people of this city. And I listened to it and went, okay. The climate of our city is tense. We need to be really, really, really good at walking in grace and kindness and love. We're not going to flaunt our rights. We're going to walk in grace and love. We walk outside these doors. Please, please, nobody walk into a restaurant and say, I'm not wearing a mask. My pastor told me I don't have to. <laughs> that is wrong, and that is a violation of Romans 13. But protecting the unique gift to the people of God of being able to worship together. You see, our worship has an authority in the spirit realm that I don't think, I don't think the enemy misunderstands. I think he's fully aware of what happens if a united people of God come together to declare the praises of God over situations. It wasn't just a song we were singing because it sounded good and it was fun. To declare he reigns over this region, for me, what was going on inside of me is absolutely this is your situation. It doesn't belong to the enemy. The city is yours. You reign over it. You reign over my household. You reign over this church. I will not sit back and be silent and say, I wonder what's going to happen. I'm going to declare openly the king of glory is reigning over this situation. I'm going to align with that reigning. And that means outside these doors I walk in honor. Inside these doors, fervently I declare his praises because I know it works in the region. Those are the reasons we took a stand. I felt like the Lord said, it's time. My heart cries, please, please, please. Protect this freedom with the gentleness to say, we're not using it as a right. We're just working for the city. Because we understand when we gather together, we are an agency of heaven that can supernaturally do things in the region. So we come together, we build each other up, in our most holy faith, all of a sudden, the New Testament became kind of real. Like, we need each other. We need this encounter. We don't, just, we don't need our bands to be good. We just need them to go vertical. I'm like, I, I, all I need from you guys is just go and take us into the Holy of Holies. Let us get there. Let's pour out our hearts. Let's believe that this house could be a house that every ounce of sickness that walks in those doors gets supernaturally healed and nobody can figure it out. And we understand that just like Israel marching around Jericho, we're declaring the praises of God with an intentionality. The intentionality is that darkness falls. Right. We're not just coming together to sing. We're coming together with an agenda to break things in the region through our praise. We're coming together to hug on each other, to love on each other, to greet each other, because we know, hey, this week, for the next six days, you're going out there, and I want you to know I'm with you, I'm for you, come on, let's go. We have a city to reach, we have a city to love, we've been planted here with a purpose, the kingdom of God, his agenda is that Fort Collins understands the king of glory sits here, and he's got people who want to bless the house. I walk into restaurants, I spend my money in those restaurants. Why? Because I want to bless the city. Because if it goes well for the city you live in, it goes well for you. This is Jeremiah's word. So please, with everything in us, let's not flaunt 
with arrogance. Let's lovingly, graciously stand our ground. Does that make sense? John told me I can't say that. I just did. Sorry, John. He's like, just leave it. Just let people sit and go, oh. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> I don't think what I say is that important. Hey, let's dive into Jeremiah 29. I want to take us through a little bit of the scriptures today. Are we good? Okay. I just got to find where I put my teaching. Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who had been exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And this was after King Jehoiakim, the queen mother, the court officials, the leaders of Judah, and all the craftsmen had been deported from Jerusalem. He sent the letter with Elasa and Shaphan and Gemariah and Hilkiah when they went to Babylon as King Zedekiah's ambassadors to Nebuchadnezzar. This is what Jeremiah's letter said. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, sends this message to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food you produce. Marry and have children and then find spouses for them and have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of Babylon. Pray to the Lord for that city where you are held captive. For if Babylon has peace, so will you. The Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, Do not let the prophets and mediums who are there in Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. We've been looking at this with the, an understanding that this is Jeremiah's word to the people of God who are in Babylon. So it's a word that deals with, hey, I put you in the city. I planted you where you're at. Now here's how I want you to live. We're just taking this simple idea, superimposing it over our lives, saying God's put us here where we're at, and this is a word for us because it was a word to the people of God of how to live there. It's a word to the people of God now of how to live here. The three things that we've looked at so far is, number one, we can't miss this. God desires increase for his people in the regions we live in. I want us to consider a lot of the things that the Lord's going to be doing in the next coming season is to release entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial ideas to us. Why? Because he wants the region to do well, and part of how he does that is by putting business ideas into the hearts of his people so they can prosper in the region. Don't be afraid of those. When you're in a worship setting and the Lord drops something in your heart that you hadn't had a business thought, something comes into your mind that you hadn't considered, run with it. Write it down. Take it before the Lord. Go back to your secret place. Go, Lord, I have this idea. Is this something you want me to chase? The great, some of the greatest faith journeys that I have ever learned have been in business, not in the church. They've been in the places where I had to take crazy risks because the Lord said, hey, do this. I remember when the Lord said, hey, I want you to raise your prices. I'm like, are you crazy? Nobody's going to hire us. He's like, just trust me, raise your prices. I'm like, I, I don't know. And I had three or four jobs pending that I had to quote. In my mind, this was going to be the thing that made them choose somebody else. I had zero faith to believe the Lord would do it. Just being honest. I told him, I have no faith. It's not your fault, it's mine. I have no faith that you'll do this. And so I, I followed with what he said because at that moment it became obedience and disobedience is sin last time I checked. Just a thought. And lo and behold, we got all four jobs. Every single one of them. And I went back to the Lord. I'm like, how does this work? He's like, do you need to know or do you want to just trust me? My point is, I have learned a lot about following him in the marketplace, and I believe that's what he wants to do with his people. He wants to show them what it looks like to trust him in a place that most of the world, I would say it this way, I think being a believer in the marketplace is an unfair advantage. Because we get intel, we get to hear his voice, and we get to leverage that intel, and we get an advantage. If you haven't been using it, start. Start sitting before the Lord with your job, with, your, your, with whatever it is that he's given you for economic increase, and lay those things before him and ask him for his plans and his purposes, and then watch what happens. So God desires increase for his people in the region we live in. That's one of the things we see here. Second thing is that he desires that we 
actively work for his peace and prosperity in our city. That we're not to just wait for it. We're not to just sit back and go, if you want peace, Lord, bring it. No, we're to be a part of the process. We're to, we're to be, for me, that means we're actively in the marketplace, looking for places to bless our city, looking for things that need to be touched, finding the areas that are broken and saying, hey, you know what? I think, Lord, I could fix this. Well, how, how about, Lord, we build a plan and you go sit with the Lord and you take responsibility for the things that you encounter. Understand this, your vantage point is unique. You will see things in the marketplace that not everybody sees. And what you see is a gift. Look at it. Recognize it. Ask the Lord, hey, how do you want me to meet this? Is this mine to meet? Great questions to ask. But assume we are all to be actively finding ways to bless this city and help her prosper. Thirdly, we're under a directive to actively pray for the peace of our city. A lot of us, will, we, we, we tend to faction into those that want to work in the marketplace and those that want to pray for it. And the call of God is on all of us is to be both. I am to be at work in the marketplace watching what's going on and then coming back home saying, Lord, this is what I see. It's what I found. In, in, in my world, I have guys and gals that I, inter, that I connect with in different churches because that's in my business that I run. A lot of my prayer time is spent praying for these people that I meet because I'll come across things where I'm like, this need in their life, this need in their life. Lord, I'm going to bring it before you. Why? The assumption is he placed us where we are for a reason. If you work, I don't care where you work, you work at MCR, you work at HP, you work at Woodward, it doesn't matter where you work, just assume he put you there for a reason. And the things you see that need to be taken before the throne are your responsibility, not somebody else's. And as we all do this, we begin to infiltrate the darkness of our region. Everywhere your foot treads, I will give you, this is a promise of scripture to the people of God. Get up, look in the mirror every day and say, I have territory to take today. Not with an aggressive military idea, but with a spiritual agenda to say, Lord, when I walk into situations and I see the evidence of the enemy, I'm going to rebuke it. When I'm in a situation and I'm given opportunity to do something evil, I'm going to suppress it and choose righteousness. And by doing that, I'm going to tread on the head of the enemy. When I'm at work and everybody's wanting to steal time on the breaks, I'm going back to work on the clock the way it matters. Why? Because integrity is what you do in private. And if we're integrable in private, we'll be integrable in public. For if Babylon has peace, so will you. I want us to consider that God has an agenda for peace for his people and a process for them to walk in it. For if Babylon has peace, so will you. We could insert the name of our cities. We could say, for if Fort Collins has peace, so will you. But if we want to look at it in the Hebrew, what it really says is, for in its welfare, you will have welfare. The word here for peace is shalom, and it means peace, prosperity, and happiness. It it describes like this state of things are going good, tranquility. We would use it to describe a good housing market or good commerce or just everybody's at rest and at peace. I want us to consider the if in this. I think it's important because it would appear that what he's declaring is that your and my ability to live in peace is tied to the outpouring of his peace on the region he's put us in. Your and my ability to live in the desired peace of God for our lives is connected to the outpouring of peace in the region we live in. There's a tension between the two. Why? Because he doesn't have an agenda to release just his peace on our lives because we're the people of God. He has an agenda to release it on the regions he's planted us in. So if his ultimate purpose is peace where we're planted, perhaps in his mercy, think about this, he won't allow us to live in the fullness of that peace until our cities are in the peace he wants for them. In other words, our journey is tied to the city's journey. Because unfortunately, I think if he let us walk in the fullness of our peace, a lot of us would just tap out and be like, it's a bummer to be you. Because that's the human condition. Now, some of you might go, I'm living a really peaceful life. I would love to say this. 
I promise you, you're not living in the fullness of what he wants for you. Think about how good it could actually get. And maybe we've been considering what is peace, what is prosperity through the wrong lens. Maybe we should start asking questions of the Lord of how good can it actually get in this city? What is your dream for our city? What's in your heart for this region? What kind of crazy awesome stuff do you want us to be praying over this city? If you're in the realty world, start asking the Lord, what do you want me praying over the realty market, over the housing market? What do you want me releasing over that? Understand the declarative nature of what he's put in us, the creative ability to speak things that aren't as though they are. Perhaps for sons and daughters in the marketplace, what he's waiting for is that we just, it, the, the switch flips and we're like, wait, we can actually declare things into the marketplace and have it take root. Not with a name it and claim it thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having a deep relationship with the Holy Spirit where we walk in and say, what do you want to see here? I'll start declaring it. You work for the police department. Ask the Lord, what do you want me to, to declare? On my, on my shift, what am I supposed to be declaring as I drive around the city? What am I supposed to be releasing over neighborhoods? You work within a team for a company. Ask the Lord, what, what am I supposed to be releasing? What kind of prosperity do you want to pour out on these people? What happens if someday a bunch of people start prospering and they can't figure it out? And the reason was there was a believer that was located in their premises that understood, I actually have an authority to shape the world around me, so I'm going to declare things over people's lives. They're going to walk in a grace and a peace and a mercy that they didn't even know was possible because I did. Because I just quietly used my authority to declare peace over them. You see, instead of combating everything, what happens if we go to the offensive? And we begin to declare the goodness of God over our city. Does that mean we're blind to what's going on? No. But I think we're blind to the goodness of God a lot. We're way more disposed to, predisposed to see what's wrong and fight it than we are to see what's missing and add it. Back on my chair. <laughs> Jeremiah will shift to something that's very interesting. He says, do not let the prophets and mediums who are there in Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them. It's a really strong statement. If we look at the prior four chapters, there were voices in Israel's camp that we're declaring the exact opposite of what Jeremiah is saying. They were declaring messages that sounded awesome and exactly what the people of God wanted to hear. They were saying things like, he, we're going to be out of here in about a year or so. He's removing us from us. This is not his heart for us. He doesn't want his people to be subject to this. Blah, 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 blah. The Lord told me. What concerns me is this, is it teaches us something. It means the people of God are responsible to discern the voices that speak in his name. And it scares me because they were saying they were of God, but they weren't. And they were actually speaking directly against the place God has called, had called his people to be in. Jeremiah and Daniel, this is where Daniel's living in this same captivity the statement of heaven is, I placed you here. You're in this spot for a reason. Here's what I want you to do while you're here. Could I just suggest to us a really simple principle in scripture? The Lord loves to fight for his people. When he wants them emancipated from a situation, he removes them. He loves to see his people with this idea about themselves where they just say, you know what? It doesn't matter where I'm at because I can flourish anywhere because the king of glory is in me and everywhere he puts me is my territory. So, Lord, if you want me out of it, go ahead and move me. But I'm just going to assume where you put me, I am to bless. I'm to contend for it and work for it. I'm to stand in righteousness and trust you to remove me. How many of you have a journey or story where, even if you wanted to or not, the Lord kind of moved you from one place to another. And in those moments, you realize how sovereign and how quick it is when he wants it done. You're like, whoa, time out. 
I actually loved my life, and here we go. I'm in this region out of one of those events. I was working for Pastor Gary. I had a dream one night. It was a really specific, crazy dream, and I don't dream much. I sat down with him and said, hey, this is what I feel like the Lord said to me last night in my dream. What do you think? I was, I was working for him. I was his worship pastor at the time. He's like, oh, I hate it, but I think you're supposed to go. So we prayed through it. felt like the Lord, that's how I ended up in this region. I had no idea this was going to happen out of that decision. But the Lord did. I had no idea Pastor Gary would be here with me. So we got to come full circle and still work together. But the Lord sovereignly moved the location. My, 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 my point is this. I think we should stop fighting where we are. Instead, focus on how we are in that region. And if the Lord wants to move us, he can move us. I think that's the way the scriptures really teach. These prophetic voices were in their camp. It's important we know this. It was not the Babylonians speaking into the people of Israel. It was people of God speaking. And the word, the word phrase, who are there with you in Babylon, actually means within your circle or close to you. And I think this happens in our time as well. And I want to caution us. Anybody who's declaring things that are contrary to honor, contrary to properly coming under authority, contrary to really digging in and rooting in and serving the city we're in, those are probably not voices from God. And I think we must understand it is on us to manage our attitudes and perspectives towards the city God has planted us in. That's a deep responsibility. We learn to take every attitude, thought, and perspective to him in the secret place and run it through the lens of scriptures. We might have the authority to air our perspectives as citizens in the United States, but we might not have the authority in scripture to let those things fly. We might be a people that are under a higher authority, and we are to be very careful of what comes out of our mouth, what comes into our heart and dwells there. And we learn to take it before him in the secret place. Just lay it in front of him. Lord, this is how I feel about X, Y, Z. Will you please speak into it? All right, that's enough. Let's stand. And I'm on time anyway, so. There's no greater commodity in our culture than time, so I'm going to honor it. Church, I think we're in a, a, an unprecedented season, yes, but also an incredible opportunity to put a big old grin on our face, be the people of God, and work for the peace of this city, contend for the peace of this city. I want to invite you to, tomorrow, whatever your job is, whether it's, hey, I'm a homemaker, great. Sit with the Lord and say, how do I bless the people you've given me to serve? You go to the marketplace. Lord, what, what's your agenda for me today? Don't ask. You want me to work hard. That's a given. It's also the key to prosperity. But let's get serious. Take serious the charge to show up with the grace of the kingdom in us and love this region. Lord, we love you today. We ask that your face would be upon us as we head back into the marketplace to be the people you've called us to be. Our heart cry, Lord, is bring, re bring revival to this region. Lord, bring, bring an absolute transformation to this region. Lord, we're crying out for all the metrics to begin to shift towards the kingdom. That all the things, like things like the abortion rate, things like the divorce rate, all the things that are contrary to your heart, Lord, we do stand and contend for this city. We are crying out for the city you've put us in, Lord. We want to work for the peace of this city. We want to pray for the prosperity of the city. We're asking you to bring a, a framework to our minds to see the city differently from this point forward. May we walk in honor, careful, careful honor. Would you give us the grace to, to be careful with our mouth? Lord, the courage to get honest with our hearts before you. 
And Lord, would you put a dumb grin on our face that nobody can wipe off? Because we're in love with you and we realize the opportunity that's in front of us to shape this region. We love you, we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.